Welcome to the eighth installment of the Better Together Food System Best Practices for Navigating COVID-19 Discussion Series. Uh, for those of you who have joined previous sessions, you'll know we hosted a series of these installments back in early spring at the beginning of the pandemic and have since relaunched uh, for an additional four, four sessions this late summer, I suppose, um, as we're hearing additional issues that are being felt through supply chain as well as additional practices and solutions and innovations that are coming to light. So the, uh, this week is now our third installment of the relaunch and we'll have one additional session next week for those that are interested and able to join. So far we've talked about the topics of re-emergence among restaurant operators as well as uh, challenges and solutions around forecasting and demand planning in the pandemic. Uh, our hope is to continue that discussion as well as to continue our role as a catalyst to drive solutions, uh, as well as a facilitator of connections and collaboration through these discussions. Today, I'm very excited that we're going to be talking on the topic of consumers. I think this is probably top of mind for a lot of people uh, throughout the pandemic in the various areas and sectors in which we're working. COVID-19 has affected us personally, the way we all think, feel, and operate, as well as the broader consumer population as well. And it may have forever altered behaviors and attitude towards food, everything from dining in new places than we typically would to increased interest in food prices and, and issues like food justice. So today we're gonna to be learning from a panel of experts who study and work with consumers every day. And they're gonna be sharing some best practices for engaging with consumers to build a more sustainable and less wasteful food system. Before I introduce our panelists, I'm gonna ask if Lily can bring up a quick poll uh, if you can take a second to fill this out, this is going to ask for the sector that best describes you and is going to give us a little bit of perspective on who's joining us on the line today. So we'll give you just a few seconds to make your selection. Great. Thank you so much. This is helpful, hopefully for all of us, but I think especially for the speakers today, just to get a better sense of, of who they're talking to in a day when we can't necessarily see your faces around the room. So thank you for taking the time to do that. All right, uh, so we are gonna first hear from three panelists today um, with some opening comments and questions from me around the challenges and solutions that they're seeing. We will then open it up to Q&A across the group. So a friendly reminder to please find that chat function if you would like to submit a question for our panelists. You can do that at any time during the conversation today and we'll be moderating that, that comment box closely. With that, let me introduce our speakers. First, we have the wonderful Joel, who he says he is best known as the host for A&E's hit series Scraps and appearances on NBC's Today show, I would like to think he's best known for hosting our summit last year for those who attended. So we'll, we'll run the competition there and see what's more popular. Uh, but Joel has become one of the nation's most well-known sustainability and food waste focused chefs. In addition to his television show, Joel was the national chef for Sur La Table and the author of Cooking Scrappy. Next, we have Andrea, who's joining us as the Vice President of Global Responsibility and Sustainability at Nielsen where she oversees the Nielsen Cares Global Volunteering Program. Andrea manages skills-based volunteering, pro bono work in relationships in the priority areas for diversity and inclusion and technology and education. Interestingly, she also is the director of grant making for the Nielsen Foundation, which is a private foundation originally funded by Nielsen. And last but certainly not least, we have Brian Rowe, who's the Van Buren Professor and Associate Chair of the Department of Agriculture, Environment, and Department Economics at The Ohio State University. Uh, Dr. Rowe has worked broadly in the areas of agriculture and environmental economics, focusing on issues including food waste, agricultural marketing, information policy, behavioral economics, and product quality. So we have a really exciting group of panelists today coming from very different perspectives, I think, as we talk about the issue of consumers. So very excited to get their, their perspectives. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of ask a couple questions to get us started, but please do go ahead and start submitting your own questions at any point. And panelists, let's go ahead, at least initially, um, in responding in the order that I introduced you. So Joel, Andrea, and Brian. My first question that I'd love to hear your thoughts on is, 
how has COVID-19 changed consumer behavior generally? And how have those changes, if you've seen it, um, affected food waste reduction? So with that, Joel, I will turn it over to you to kick us off. Okay. Well, thank you, Jackie. And hello, everybody. So good to meet you. Uh, virtually, I've been a long time partner of ReFed. And whenever I go to an event or, or talk like something like this, it, it feels like I'm amongst family. We're all food waste warriors together. So pleasure to be here. Um, some of the biggest things that I've seen, so first and foremost, I was telling some of the panelists a couple of days ago, um, my following as a kind of a, the face of food waste in the food world um, has gone up 500% since COVID. Uh, my content hasn't necessarily changed. It's always been about raising awareness around food waste. Um, but all of a sudden, consumers seem to be more interested in, in it. Um, they want more recipes with carrot tops. They want to understand what to do with their chicken bones. I think for lots of different reasons, right? But it's been really interesting to see the interest in food waste all of a sudden being a thing. I think amongst us, we realized, you know, many years ago for a lot of us, how big of this problem we are all sitting on. Um, but now that food waste is not really optional for people, they're now sitting with us. And so one of the biggest things I see is that it's on people's radars in a much bigger way. And it's going um, viral and national in a much bigger way. With that said, I also think um, I see a lot of overwhelmness. I think with the pandemic um, and, and with so many different issues on the table, food waste is somewhat getting lost in kind of the mix. There's so many different things that people need to tackle um, that the idea of food waste, food waste can kind of somewhat feel overwhelming. So another thing I'm seeing amongst uh, consumers, people that I talk to, my audience, is it's a huge topic and they don't really know if they have the ability to address it. So what it really makes me believe is how can we address it for them? And I know we'll get to kind of solves and, and all that for them, but we really need to serve up these solves to these consumers because I think there's just a lot going on in their individual world, worlds right now. Um, and the last thing I'm really seeing that I think is an amazing trend and I'll talk more about is content marketing and the use of it to really empower people and educate people around food waste. Um, I'm seeing brands that would never, ever talk about food waste, brands that we all know, Campbell's, Morton Salt, um, monster, monster brands that, that, um, that, you know, maybe have been tickling the idea or kind of whispering the idea, but are now really standing behind the idea in a big way. And I'm seeing what's really clicking with consumers, which is content and storytelling. And, and that is key to getting your message across. So those are the kind of the three big things that I'm seeing from kind of a consumer behavior because of COVID. Thanks, Joel. Uh, Andrea, you and the team are swimming in data. Do you wanna share some of the key highlights and trends that you've been noticing on the changes in consumer behavior? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll focus a little bit more on some of the data that our team and our intelligence, um, our Nielsen intelligence team has been putting out kind of on how consumers are consuming food differently, whether that's through shopping trips and that sort of thing, and then kind of draw the connection then to, to food waste there. And, you know, what, it's been really fascinating to see how the research by our intelligence team has evolved where, you know, right when the COVID crisis hit, <clears throat> the, one of the major messages was how much consumers are changing their behavior like you could track if you know a press conference or some new piece of news came out with COVID you could then tie that to what was happening in in the stores and how how and what consumers were buying and that's changed um, quite a bit since then like the news cycle is no longer tied to um, what people are buying and where but we're seeing these um, these resets in in behavior that that are really sticking now and it, it's changed based on um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's changed based on, you know, what, where consumers, if they've been a little more insulated, if they're working from home, if they've been able to, you know, keep their, their incomes relatively steady um, versus whether they're, they're constrained and whether they're really starting to feel the pinch of, um, of changes in their employment situation and that sort of thing. And so a few of the, the key kind of highlights or things that have stood out um, to me and that, that I really think have some interesting implications as it comes to how um, 
we tackle food waste systemically across the board. Um, one is just, you know, just echoing what Joe was saying, it, it's the homebody economy. There's a homebody reset, you know, that there's 54% of Americans are now reporting that they cook more at home than they did before the crisis. And that also goes through to takeout and meal kit behavior. 24% of Americans are ordering, you know, takeout food more often, 17% ordering food delivery more often than they did before COVID. And some of these, um, and that's not even to, to mention the shifts that we're seeing globally and the huge skyrocketing demand for things like click and collect or home delivery of groceries, online purchasing, and these are things that um, that people are really sticking with, that, that they think even after the COVID crisis passing, they're seeing some of these technological shifts and, and conveniences and, and they're not necessarily going to go back to their regular routines. And so I think thinking about um, you know, how, how people are shifting their behavior based on those channels. And, you know, are people buying things in value packs for their freezers more, you know, we're, at first we saw a lot of the kind of shelf stable foods in terms of, you know, dried beans and powdered milk and, and the things that are, are going to be, you know, pantry stockpiling. But we've also seen huge growth in frozen foods and frozen produce. And while those have a much longer shelf life than, than fresh, um, they still do have a shelf life and people might be buying and have been buying things um, that they might not have otherwise bought because that's what they found on the shelf. And now it's a matter of, you know, do they know exactly what to do with these new ingredients, what to do with these new brands, um, and, and making sure that it's not just something that they did to stock their pantry to feel safer, but how, you know, how can they use these new foods or, or their stocked pantry and stocked freezers um, in new ways. And a couple of the other things that I think are really interesting for their implications of food waste. One is the, um, the emphasis on local. We're seeing um, some of uh, the work out of our Basie's innovation team on you know, what claims peop on products people are, are really focusing more on. Um, you know, but prior to the crisis, we saw a lot of focus that people, you know, were reporting they're looking for sustainable, they're looking for organic. Um, and to some extent, that's still true. But we've seen a big shift toward people focusing more on beyond just what's happening systemically. Like if you feel, see a sustainable product and or a sustainable um, food claim, and you're going to buy that because you know, like, I'm doing a good thing for you know, the broader system that I'm a part of. Now they're reaching more for products that are much more about how is this going to be health, you know, what is this health claim, you know, boosting immunity, vitamin C, like those sorts of things that people are really kind of sh pivoting back toward, okay, what does this product do specifically for me? Um, and then in terms of the local economy, people are, are really paying more attention to how far and where their food and products are traveling from, especially when you think about like fresh produce and that sort of thing. They're, they're trying to, um, we're seeing a little bit of a shift to reducing um, the, the, both geographically as well as time from you know, a farmer to where they're purchasing it. Um, so I, I think that all of these, um, and you know, like you said, there, we are swimming in data. There's so much um, that the team's been putting out. But those are some of the key findings in terms of, you know, the, the shift toward focusing more on health claims. Um, some of these behavioral resets that we're seeing with, you know, the homebody economy and, and uh, you know, what people are reaching for in their basket. Um, the constraints in terms of, of spending and how consumers are sort of um, either insulated or constrained and, and how we're thinking about them, those individual groups. Um, and then the shift to local that I think will have really, you know, interesting implications and for food waste and how we think about supply chains and, and food rescue. That's great, Andrea. Thank you for walking us through that. And Brian, I know you guys have a lot of kind of brand new research that's come out in recent days from the findings that you're seeing as a result of the pandemic. So again, would ask for you to comment on some of those general findings of what you're seeing shift in consumer behavior. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. Yeah, we um, reached out to over 500 uh, respondents, small by Nielsen standards, but we were able to kind of dig in a little bit deeper in a few different angles that um, we hadn't seen at uh, kind of addressed in the literature and in the newspapers and the trade magazines yet. And 
we found again, but kind of about 58%, I think you said 54% in your survey, said that they're cooking more frequently at home compared to the same time last year. And we kind of asked them, you know, do they feel like they're accumulating experience getting better at this because they are now homebodies? And about half said that their cooking and their food management levels had improved uh, since the onset of COVID-19. And I'll note that all these figures are available at our um, <clears throat> Ohio State Food Waste Collaborative uh, website. We've got a report up with uh, this uh, survey that we did in early July. Um, the, free, the, the use of refrigeration has also gone up. Um, about a third report fuller refrigerators and freezers um, versus only about 10% reporting emptier refrigerators and freezers. Uh, the interesting kind of long-term thing that we found was that more than a quarter had actually added a refrigerator to their home, either went out and bought one or perhaps uh, kind of reinvigorated that old beer fridge that from, the, from the garage and made it permanent. Uh, and more than 10% had added freezer capacity at home. And so uh, these are gonna have, I think, longer run <clears throat> implications um, because, you know, once things goes into the freezer, who knows what happens to them, um, particularly if people are freezing items that weren't designed to be frozen, they may have some implications for um, how much is going to be wasted down the road. And these are things that could hang on, obviously, and particularly in the freezer. Um, we know people that have uh, that move with frozen items, so these can be there for years, if not decades. Um, the other thing we did, we kind of pushed them on, you know, COVID hit people very differently. Um, and we kind of said, you know, taking everything into consideration, how your work has changed, how your family obligations, your homeschooling obligations have changed. About 40% reported having more time available to them to kind of do things that interested them, including cooking. And in fact, that group said that they were more likely to be cooking at home than others who felt more time crunched. The other people that seem to be cooking more often are those who've been pinched, those who are uh, having to rely on some type of government aid, either through unemployment or snack, SNAP or WIC or some other type of aid. Those have also increased their home cooking frequency as well. Um, and the other thing is those people who have become more reliant are now uh, facing a, you know, a very difficult food scenario where they're going to the emergency food system and you know, some of the rules of the road there have changed in terms of uh, not only in the retail settings, but also in the emergency food setting as well. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of effort to try to connect some of those bottlenecks in the early in the supply chain um, through the um, Farmers to Families food box that USDA puts out there. And that's, that's great. They're able to find items that farmers weren't able to uh, move through typical channels and connect them to the emergency food system. But we also know that when um, food boxes are pre-prepared and kind of pre-proportioned, um, that's tend that, that'll tend to lead to a little bit more waste when people are getting kind of a pre-set box of food through the emergency food system rather than having their own ability to choose what goes into that emergency food bundle that they get. So um, just some interesting things happening out there that really are going to uh, affect how people are um, wasting at home and um, um, kind of efficiently using their food. Great, thank you. That that helps set things at the stage of what we're seeing as far as some of these changes happening over the past several months. Uh, one follow-up question for me before we start going to some of the audience Q&A and just a reminder for those that have joined in the past few minutes, you can submit questions through the chat box to the comments and questions name that you see there. But I want to go back around kind of in that same order. You've, you've talked about the changes and some of the challenges that you've seen. I'd like to dedicate a few minutes to talking about what are some of the strategies, solutions, and best practices that you've seen or implemented yourself um, as a result of those challenges. So Joel, we'll start again with you. Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I, I, I agree with the other panelist, Brian, just said, you know, I, we kind of have, have this pocket of time right now where people are really interested in changing behavior, which is very rare. Um, and so we have their attention. And when you have someone's attention, we have an opportunity to really serve something up to them that can be helpful because they're listening. So for me, from kind of a marketing standpoint and kind of um, how to engage the consumer, what's been really successful is vulnerability and storytelling. So I'll explain that. Vulnerability means, um, in my mind, when it comes to businesses, it's letting people in. I think right now, um, businesses who are showing even a struggle 
um, are seeing a lot of amazing support and results because of it. Uh, an example of that is a milk company. They do non-dairy milk um, that I work with. Um, and they were sourcing almonds from Spain and also from California. And the ones from Spain were way cheaper um, and, and they were organic. And the ones from California were not organic, um, but super expensive. And so they had this weird dilemma. And instead of trying to kind of hide it um, and mask it behind some sort of claim, they asked their audience, which almonds do you want in your milk? You know, and they let them in, they were vulnerable. We don't know the answer. We want you to be a part of the answer. And so because of that, I think people trust them and they and people are willing to follow them and reason with them and whatever decide, they decide to go, they did it together. Um, I think that is a really big solve is to be vulnerable. Uh, another huge solve is to serve up education and helpful information. I think when we're trying to get our point across about what we do, whether you're a retailer, uh, you're you know, a food rescuer, a nonprofit, I think that we tend to just talk about our message and talk about our message, but we're in this economy right now where it's a two-way conversation. I think Zoom and this whole idea of that we are all on the same platform right now, we wanna listen as much as talk. And so that means opening up questions and, and asking questions, but at the same time, empowering our consumers and not just serving them kind of blasts of what we want, but what helps them. So for example, if you're a food manufacturer right now, that saves carrots, right? And you make carrot snacks. Um, you should be serving up all the different ways that someone at home could be using their carrots. And like Brian and Andrea both said, people are listening about that. They have carrots, they, more people are cooking. And so all of a sudden they're connecting to your brand in a new way. So serving up helpful content and storytelling in your content is never been more successful than right now. People need it. They don't want it. It's not like a, it, it's an optional thing people need help right now. And so when you're willing to help them for free, um, then you're able to kind of integrate your messaging and bring consumers along the ride with you. So those are the two things that I would say really stand out for me as strategies is be vulnerable and make sure that you storytell and you put out content that's helpful, not just kind of self-serving, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. Andrea, what would you like to add? Yeah, um, I completely agree with, with what Joel is saying. And I, I think that that storytelling um, specifically aimed at, um, you know, focusing on the, the individual and the individual household at this point, I think um, I'm seeing in the data, but also just anecdotally can be especially powerful. Um, that kind of goes along with what I was talking about before where, where consumers are paying a little bit more attention to some of the, these health benefits and claims versus the more systemic sustainability issues at this moment. That will not always be the case, but um, I, th I think that to the extent that people can understand not just um, how, how reducing or the, the choices that I'm making of, of what food I'm buying and how I'm reducing my, my personal food waste, what impact that has on their wallet, especially when we're talking about those constrained consumers, what impact that has on, um, on their own, you know, household management versus I'm, you know, not throwing away, Brian, what you were talking about, this thing that shouldn't have been frozen, and they're, you know, I'm finding a way to use it, and therefore I'm ha having, you know, half a pound of impact to the, you know, billions of pounds of food waste a year. I think it's harder to make those systemic ties right now, just because p consumers are feeling so incredibly overwhelmed with these huge, um, these huge systemic issues tied to the COVID crisis. So I think, um, again, tying tying the the emphasis on how to how to couch your choices and reduce food waste and the implications that that can have on individuals individual families individual households um, can be you know more effective at this time than ever um, a few other things that um, that our intelligence team is especially um, seeing and emphasizing is you know emphasizing, those those qualities and efficiency to to the products to to really emphasize those those safety claims and and the uh, you know transparency and Joel what he was saying about vulnerability transparency and, and vulnerability in the supply chain um, I think that that helps consumers make 
these more informed and educated choices right now, as opposed to um, just kind of doing like a supermarket sweep through an aisle and grabbing whatever it is that, that they can find because of stockouts, although those are certainly um, reduced than they were at the, the beginning of the crisis. Um, that, you know, they're, they're having those thoughtful choices about, about what they're putting in their cart. And, and then looking for ways to leverage um, the really uh, embrace of the technology that, that consumers are, you know, we've been moving toward, you know, greater e-commerce, greater click and collect, greater home delivery of groceries. This has just sped everything up. Um, so what does that mean when we can reduce across the industry cycle time of, of if someone wants to be able, you know, are they going to be able to plan for three days of meals and then, you know, be able to identify those specific things that they need for those three meals. That's going to be, you know, greater, give them greater flexibility for their wallet because they're not having to do a huge stock up. It gives them greater convenience and then it reduces as a byproduct food waste because they're not buying, you know, $400 worth of things and then forgetting what's in their freezer. So I think referencing and using some of the, this focus on individuals and individual household and what reduction of food waste and their consumer choices can have on their lives right now um, as individuals, and then leveraging and thinking about new ways to, um, to take advantage of the, the shift to these new technologies and the shift to using these new convenience channels um, to get groceries that, and, and to get food in, in new ways that can really um, hopefully have a, a great follow-on impact for, um, for reducing food waste as well. That's great, Andrew. I think you and Joel both bring up a great theme just around the, the importance of relevance, whether that's individuals or households, and making the content and the messaging um, very applicable to, at that level. Brian, let's go to you and see what else you would add as far as kind of best practices and strategies you're seeing. Sure. I mean, talk about new technology, but maybe we can think about old technology, right? There's a lot of gardens planted, um, over uh, as COVID bore down, I think a lot of the seed places are reporting nearly being out of everything. So right now across the Midwest and probably across the country, there's just a lot of uh, produce coming off that uh, for first time people. So there's a huge need for people to understand, kind of go back to Home Ec 101 basically and learn about how to freeze, preserve, can, uh, jarring, <clears throat> whatever it takes to uh, make that new bounty uh, something that they can use and not waste. Um, that's going to have implications, obviously, for our major re major uh, canners and um, uh, sellers out there. But we want to make sure that people are using that and potentially sharing that in safe and appropriate ways um, for those who are food insecure right now. <clears throat> and um, I think also um, thinking about that emergency food system, I think there are probably a lot of people out there who did go out and panic purchase items. Um, and, you know, we know other studies have shown these items will hang around for a long time, particularly if they're shelf stable or frozen. Maybe this is the opportunity to really kind of have some gentle outreach to folks who are now in a very giving uh, frame of mind to say, hey, go through your panic purchases. <clears throat> what is it that you really don't think you're going to use that's still in date <clears throat> that you can then share uh, with neighbors, with the community, with those who might be food insecure in a, in a safe way and prompt people to do that. Um, and on that preservation front as well, <clears throat> really help people understand how to best um, use those freezers and refrigerators so they don't become guilt alleviation mechanisms and actually become appropriate ways to reduce um, their waste in their homes. And if you do have um, um, input <clears throat> with your emergency food providers, to think if there is a way to make sure that um, you are giving those clients as much autonomy as you can when they go in to choose their boxes. Because right now I think there are a lot of uh, prefab boxes coming out because of um, the USDA programs. And just figuring out a way to make sure you can make as much autonomy as is possible so that those who are relying on the emergency food system are able to choose what they need and are less likely to waste and feel more empowered because they do have some of that autonomy as well. So those are just some of the things that come to my mind um, uh, from that prompt. 
Great. Thank you, Brian. Um, and thank you for, again, helping us set the stage with these couple of, of framing questions. We have a lot of great questions coming in from um, audience members. So I want to start getting to some of those. And, and again, just remind people who joined recently, you can submit those through the chat bar. Um, there's a couple of questions around different related to purchasing. So maybe starting with the first one, Andrea, this one was directed to you, but invite anyone else to chime in as well. You talked about some of these uh, purchasing behaviors and trends. Mm -hmm. The first question is around, um, do you have any connections between what people are buying and kind of how they're paying for it or impacts of programs like SNAP or any of the other government assistance programs or implications of, of the impacts of, of um, income changes within households? Do you see that driving any of the behavior change on purchase? data. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great point. And the, the framework um, that I mentioned uh, earlier that our intelligence team came out with, I think it was just released in the last few days. You can find it on uh, nielsen.com slash COVID-19. It really goes kind of um, basket or uh, dip, the different behavioral resets that, that our intelligence team is seeing. One around the basket reset, kind of what consumers are buying, uh, the homebody reset, where consumption will happen, rationale reset, why consumers are making those purchases, and then affordability and how much consumers can spend. And they break those, each, each of those resets down by, you know, whether they are more, their wealth and their income is more insulated. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, people that are working corporate jobs and they have the flexibility to kind of shift and pivot and not, um, you know, have lose too much um, childcare not accepting um, in terms of their, uh, in terms of their, their day-to-day -day work versus constrained consumers. Um, because we know, and, and the intelligence team also has articles out there about this, we know how much unemployment is going to be um, persistent and driving a lot of these changes in consumption. And who, you know, someone that is an insulated consumer today, maybe a constrained consumer, you know, next week. Um, and that's what, in terms of how consumers are paying for these purchases, that's one thing that I know our, um, our leadership on the diversity and inclusion team has been looking a lot at through uh, some of the diverse intelligence series that they've been putting out. Um, because we know, like there are some states where SNAP is, uh, like take for example, the, um, the shift to online purchasing. There are some states that we know that SNAP benefits can be used online and there are others that, that can't. And so looking at, you know, is the emergency of food, the emergency food assistance and the, the programs that people are able to, to get benefits from their governments, you know, is that matching up with how these consumer shifts are happening and where they, not only where they can get their products, but where they need to get their products for public health reasons or, you know, for having these larger multi-generational households when people are taking care of, of, you know, elderly parents and they might be even more um, hesitant to go out and, and do these shopping trips in person. Um, where and how can the gaps between where these assistance programs can be used and what we're seeing, you know, where consumers are, are actually purchasing, I think is something that uh, should, should certainly be looked at by policymakers and try to prioritize in terms of, you know, can we make SNAP, you know, available online everywhere um, as, as one example. I just know that, you know, the additional SNAP benefit, which a lot of um, localities got, I think was also quite meaningful because just the overall uh, price index for food at home <clears throat> um, has gone up uh, about, what was it 5.66% <clears throat> year over year um, in June, I think is the last number that came out of USDA. And that's one of the larger price increases, year over year price increases we've seen um, for about a decade. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, that was very important. And as our data shows, those who are receiving that government aid really are the ones who are cooking it more at home right now. <clears throat> and so, um, so I, I think just making that connection and realizing that as benefits shift, either unemployment or uh, food stamp uh, additional benefits shift, that's really gonna shift these uh, purchasing patterns. And given we just don't know the stability of <clears throat> some of these uh, benefit streams and when they may phase in, phase out, be adjusted, et cetera. So uh, there's gonna be a lot of turbulence here in terms of potentially pe people's purchasing patterns. 
Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, and, and Andrea and Brian might have more data to back this up, um, but I know for a fact that fresh fruits and vegetables and the buying of kind of the inside of the grocery store as opposed to the processed and sugary things on the outside of the grocery store um, are, are much lower right now. So people are buying a lot, even though they're cooking at home, for some reason, processed foods are skyrocketing in popularity. And I'm sure, Andrea, you have something to add there, but... Um, you know, I don't know if it's because we're eating our feelings or if it's because <laughs> of, of what, but. Well, I did, you know, I did see, um, this, I think this data was from back in April, um, but they did, there were, were actually, I think some of the fresh fruit and fresh fruits and vegetables have gone down, but frozen has gone up. Um, that might be again, because of what's available where, um, or it might be tied to the effect that Brian was talking about in terms of like adding additional freezers and refrigerators to, to make sure that, that we not, not only we as consumers, not only have food on hand today, but also for the future and, and kind of hedging against some of that uncertainty. Um, so I think, yeah, for the period ended April 4th, um, frozen and shelf stable fruit actually grew at three to five times the rate of fresh fruit um, in, in the previous year. But again, like that kind of still raises the question of, you know, are people just getting this because that's what's available? And then are they using it? Do they, did they buy it because they had a recipe or an intention to use it? Or are they buying it to stockpile it and then forget about it for a couple of years? Um, and so I think that that's some of the, um, yeah, for sure, the, the implications to, to think through. Yeah, really, really interesting stuff there when you start looking at the numbers, I'm sure. Um, a couple questions related to content. And Joel, you emphasize the importance of content right now and making sure we, we get content right. Um, there was actually another question about um, on the purchasing side about whether behavior has changed towards cooking tools and food storage. But then I think, you know, P Brian's reference already the hearkening back to gardens and canning. So I think with potential shifts in what people are buying to eat, what they're buying to cook with, and the practices that they're having to shift in home, are you seeing drastic shifts in the type of content that has become relatable to consumers, especially through your engagement with cooking shows and whatnot? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so yes, all of a sudden people are interested in preserving. And I think it's funny because we all probably have grandparents or great grandparents um, or parents um, who were maybe around during the Great Depression. And you know what they've always said to us as growing up, they're like, don't waste anything, like, you know, nothing. And that missed a couple generations as, you know, the economy grew and the Industrial Revolution and all that. And we became a very wasteful place. Um, I think it's becoming in fashion again to go back to the Depression times and and be waste free. And so when people are looking at what kind of content um, is really, really helpful, they're looking at little tips, hacks, tricks. Um, if you're looking about how to kind of bring in new consumers and, and move to kind of social media, any video is gonna outdo a picture or a still image. Anything under a minute is gonna outdo anything over a minute. And anything under 15 seconds is gonna be the best. So if you can figure out a 15 second video about how to save food and how, and ultimately that means how people are going to save money, how they're going to save the environment, how they're going to save flavor, because let's be honest right now, and, and always, people are really um, worried about themselves, but food waste can really integrate into that. So for example, some of the best things I've done is, is um, I made a banana peel bacon right, where I literally took banana peels, which are eaten all over the world except for the United States, and I made a vegan bacon by putting a little maple and brown sugar in it, and I did it in 15 seconds, and it got like over a million views. So it's helpful, um, it's a little different, um, it's a twist on something. So that's the type of content that's resonating with people, short, snappy, you know, it doesn't need to be a full recipe, it doesn't need to be a full story, but it does need to kind of give them something helpful um, in the blink of an eye. Yeah, and one thing I, I just want to add to that, um, to tie in to, because now I want to make that vegan bacon, Joel, <laughs> is um, to tie in to the data we were seeing about takeout and how people are using, or I think it was the 24% of Americans that are ordering takeout more often. Um, 
that a has an implication for for people's budgets because that costs more than being able to make food themselves but then sometimes especially if household size is in flux with with you know different family members or we've we've seen obviously a lot of younger people that um have were living on their own in the cities and and wanted needed to to come back um to live with their parents to write out kind of the the worst of the the quarantine um you know if people have takeout left over um, after, you know, ordering a, a night out of food, but then not enough for a second meal for everyone, they might look at that and be like, okay, like I'll snack on that for a few days or I'll, you know, put it in the back of the fridge and forget about it. And, you know, another week, then they, it just got mold on it and they throw it out. Whereas if we can, um, you know, lean into that trend and say, okay, like if, if they're, you know, picking up takeout and they can say, you know, if you've got leftover curry, here's three more things you can do with that curry that aren't the exact same thing, just a second helping of it or something. So, you know, I, I wanted to just tie into to some of that takeout data too. And, and, you know, I think that content not only can be about um, what people are cooking themselves, but also if they're take if they're you know taking advantage of some of these these restaurants and places that are leaning into new models themselves to keep the doors open how how we can reduce food waste through that channel as well yeah i think the pew foundation said it was like one in ten households had a um a 20 something move back in with them <clears throat> post covid and i know my own personal 20 something who moved back in um uh they all they love the take out and they'll eat it for breakfast. So there's actually an opportunity there for um, there to be, you know, these items that we, uh, if, it, if it's a, a smaller household might have gone to waste in the back of the fridge. If we just pull it forward, put it in a transparent box <clears throat> and kind of label it as pizza from place X that you know yeah. that <laughs> your 20 year old loves, uh, that might quickly disappear and um, uh, take some of that food waste burden off and make some people very happy. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to just echo one thing that you guys are both touching on that's really important is when you're creating content, try not to be food waste forward. And I know that seems really weird um, to say on a call like this where we're all working our butts off to kind of spread the message. But food waste, like I said in the very beginning, um, kind of my opening remarks, super over overwhelming you know to hear about climate change right now and how many bazillions of tons of food is rotting in landfills and the methane gas people just don't have the capacity it's crazy so you have to lead with the pizza like brian said right or like andrea said with the recipes we had the takeout like we have to lead with other things besides food waste barnana um, a company that makes snacks out of rescued bananas. Last year, they rescued 100 million bananas. You've seen their plantain chips. You've seen their, their snacks. They're awesome. You'll notice their packaging has nothing to do with food waste until you get to the very back and there's a little story about food waste and it's genius. It's perfect. You know, they're, they're more about the flavor. They're more about the convenience. They're more about, you know, all those pieces that really are what people want to be served and then they thread the food waste in afterwards. That's a great comment, Joel. I think you know, food waste is a is a solution or a strategy for so many other issues as well. And so that that's a good way to tie that in, perhaps as a secondary message when it's appropriate. Um, I have a question in that I personally really like around date labeling. So Brian, maybe I'll go to you first on this one and let others chime in. But curious about panelists' um, perspectives on how date labels are now being used and if there's opportunity to be doing more education around date labels if people are in fact paying more attention these days. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, um, we, we still struggle at the national level to have kind of uniform date labels around which we can then educate people. Um, and it's a tough educational task because there are that small group of items that do have some safety implications <clears throat> that surround that date label. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, now more than ever, we need to let people know that outside of that small group of items, those dates are mainly about quality and, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, you should uh, really be able to evaluate kind of um, <clears throat> those items for the sake of quality, uh, other than your soft cheeses and uh, your raw meats and a few other things where the date's going to be something you have to 
um, <clears throat> uh, uh, have to pay more attention to. But um, yeah, it's, it, I just wish there was a harmonized labeling right now so that we could be a little bit clearer uh, about what the dates really mean for, for uh, consumers. Yeah, Andrew, it's, it's Joel, just, anything you want to add? Oh, great. Yeah, I have a lot to add on date labeling. Um, I think it's a total mess. Um, I think it's really confusing for the consumer. I get questions all the time, what's the difference between sell by, best buy, goes by, you know, eaten by, packed by. It's, it's so unregulated and so confusing. So I think there's no question um, from a policy level, we've got to do something. I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure someone on this call does and has an idea. What, what, what needs to happen, and I know is in the works, and hopefully, again, someone on this call is, is kind of working on it, and I've connected with a couple of different companies doing this, is do you guys remember kind of the Duracell batteries that you would put your finger on and it would tell you how much battery life is left in that battery? There needs to be something like that for ingredients, and they exist, right? Little stickers that can live on the top of meat packaging um, or fruits and vegetables, and it can tell you how much gas is actually emanating out of those, um, and it's starting to kind of break down, and it can tell you, right, this has three more days to go before you use it. And so the technology actually exists. Um, I know for a fact that um, retailers are really hesitant to pilot it. I think that they always want to look plush and they always want to look full and they always want to look perfect. Um, and the reality is that some of this food is not perfect. It, they don't want to have something on their shelf that's going to go bad in a day, right? It doesn't make their brand look premium or like they're sourcing right. So that's the kind of BS we got to get away from, excuse my language, but that's the vulnerability and the openness that a company needs to be brave enough to kind of pilot, get out there and people are going to get behind. If there was some sort of solve um, to food spoilage and labeling. I think people would love it. Um, and I really think it's a huge step forward in reducing food waste. Yeah, and I, I don't have um, specific data um, that I'm aware of on the Nielsen side about, um, about dates and, and like that directly, but I think this ties really strongly into, um, because I think there's a tension between wanting to, to save money and, you know, by just be more efficient and effective with what's in our pantries. Um, but then also what I was talking about earlier, that consumers are more focused than they ever have been on making sure that whatever they're buying and whatever they're consuming is produced at the you know highest safety standards and that they feel like they can trust that food. And so, you know, I think there's a tension naturally there between I bought this product and I sp spent money on it and I don't want to waste it and I want to use it, but on the you know flip side like it's past due um, I don't know, you know, if this is safe anymore and now I'm going to because I don't want to have salmonella and food poisoning in the middle of a pandemic, I'm going to err on the side of throwing it out. Um, and so absolutely, like I think in, in lieu of someone waving a magic wand and having like an immediate, you know, <laughs> improvement in terms of the consistency and how dates are labeled, um, I think what, the education of, okay, what's, what's really a matter of safety? Like, you know, you can eat this past the point and, and you'll get sick or, you know, in cases of recalls or something like that. And what's a matter of like, yeah, this arugula doesn't smell as good as it did if you ate it before the date, but if you wash it and you fluff it up a little bit it's, and you put some dressing on it, it's going to be fine. Like, so I think that that's, that kind of gets back to some of the, the content and relatability that, that Joel and Brian were talking about earlier. Yeah, that's a great connection back to that point, Andrea. Thank you. Um, we have several questions that I actually won't have you answer right now, but just around the, where people can access these reports and resources you all have referenced. So maybe I'll just make an ask of the panelists to send any of those public reports and resources to me, and I'll make sure those are included in the follow-up email. Um, that way we don't have to, to go through and list them. Um, we do have a lot of questions we haven't gotten to today, but I'm, I'm going to steal the last one because I want to end kind of looking forward. Uh, which is kind of the same question we ask in all of these different discussions on different topics, which is basically what have we learned over the past few months and related to the topic of consumer education that we can apply to a more resilient food system going forward. So let this kind of be your closing comments perhaps um, as well as addressing that question and then we'll just cover a few final logistics uh, at the end. 
And sorry, let's add, Joel, let's start with you and kind of go in our original order that we started the call off with. Okay. So what we have learned is that um, we can do it. And let, what I mean by that is we can cook, we can save, we can do all these things when we have to, right? When there is a boot on our throat, which it is, um, we understand that we can can, that we can cook more from scratch, that we can use the freezer, that we can whip up a meal from the pantry. So we have this innate ability um, and moment in time right now where we're actually going back in time and we're kind of in touch with, like I, like I said, the Great Depression and um, when it was fashionable to save everything and it was important to save everything every, and everyone got behind it, victory gardens and everything. So we have a blink of an eye you know, open, beautiful moment where people don't want this information, they need this information. And so it is on you, no matter what business you are in, to serve them up helpful information in a really fast and accessible way. And that's why when it comes to getting your message across, no matter what you're doing, you have to have to help people through content and storytelling. You know, whether you're starting an online cooking school and Perfect Foods just launched Imperfect You, um, Sir Kensington's, uh, which is a mayo and mustard company, just started um, a new program called Taste Buds, where it's everyone's at their at home restaurant and they're empowering people to, to make the restaurants at home a thing. So, um, this really smart and, and powerful brands who are leaning into this are going to see dividends you know, beyond outside of this. So what we're learning is that people actually do have interest in a lot of the things that um, that we think they do. They do want to save food, but they want to do it because it helps them. So I really, really strongly urge everyone on this, uh, this call to get behind the idea of serving up incredible, incredible, helpful stories and content uh, to your followers and prospective followers. And then um, to, to echo Joel's comment, um, I, I love that like we, we can do it. Um, we can shift and we can um, see these huge, you know, monumental changes in the marketplace. And, um, you know, I, I think that there was there's always like a natural human inclination to being like, I mean, especially when we're thinking about huge issues like, like climate change and like food waste. Um, or, you know, if, if you're just looking at it from a business perspective, getting people to shop online more, getting people to do, you know, click and collect or home delivery or whatever it is. Um, there's a natural inclination to say like, yeah, we're moving there, but it'll take a while. And it'll, you know, it, it like we'll get there. But when we have these moments where, all of a sudden people that said like, you know, I'll never shop, you know, for my groceries online. I like to go, you know, touch every apple. And they're like, I don't want to leave the house. You know, like, so circumstances can change so quickly. And when we, you know, I, I think Jackie, we were talking before about, you know, our consumer trends just thrown out the window. Absolutely not. But we're literally looking at them now in weeks and not months or years. And so it's, you know, really being, when you're looking at creating that content that Joel was talking about, who, truly, who are the audiences you're trying to reach and getting really specific about them and their needs, whether they are the insulated consumers we were talking about before or the constrained consumers, you know, how these intersect with issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Are we looking at consumers who are already, you know, food insecure? What are the, the pack sizes? Um, I lo love Brian's point before about letting consumers have autonomy um, in, in, even if they're getting emergency food assistance because that helps them tailor the choices that they make, whether they want the value pack um, because it's going to save them money and they have somewhere to store it, or if they need to shop, you know, for one or two pieces of chicken at a time so that they can make a meal for that night or, or the next morning or, the, you know, the next day. So it's, it's really being um, even more uh, focused on the audiences that you're trying to reach, the data that you have to make sure that you know what they need and what they want, and being able to meet them where they, where they are. Um, and I'll, I'll just echo some things that, you know, COVID has kicked in all of our natural um, thriftiness instincts and 
as Joel said, it's uh, our opportunity to really amplify those. But <clears throat> transitions, and there's more transitions coming, are where big pockets of waste occur, which are going to be big opportunities um, for us to help um, clients out there to navigate those big shifts when somebody moves in, moves out, when a job goes away, when um, <clears throat> retail opens in a new way, or a restaurants open and close, try them to give them the advice to navigate those as much as possible. And there are dynamics <clears throat> that are in play and some we want to lock in. This thriftiness, we want to lock in. That's a great dynamic. But there's some troubling dynamics as well. <clears throat> Additional freezer and fridge storage is uh, a mixed bag. Um, <clears throat> you know, people are probably bringing out that beer fridge, which also is not very sustain sustainable because it was probably produced in 1997 with a much lower energy efficiency and the freezers um, hanging around are gonna probably amplify some food waste in the long run and drain their energy budget a little bit as well. So um, trying to figure out which of these dynamics we wanna try to lock in in the long run and which of those we wanna to try to redirect <clears throat> and help people think more globally about not only just food waste, but energy waste and other waste around their homes as uh, they try to uh, respond to the various uh, curveballs that COVID is gonna to continue to uh, send our way. Thank you, Brian. And just a thank you to all of our panelists as well as all of you for joining. And I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everyone's questions today. There were. There were a lot, um, but to that end, I think Alejandro is going to be sending a link through the chat here in just a second that goes to a survey, which one is asking for your feedback on the session today, but also allows you to submit any questions that were unanswered, and we'll do our best to continue facilitating a conversation with the panelists that joined us today. So again, a big thank you just for all the preparation time and also the time today from Joel, Brian, and Andrea in sharing their knowledge with us. Um, and we will be back next week for what is once again, for now, a, a final installment of this series focused on food rescue. So I invite you to join us for that conversation. Um, and we'll be sending out a recap from today's discussion by the end of the week. Um, but again, thank you, big round of applause and wishing everyone a wonderful day.